I'm Katz Nellenbogen from the University of Illinois. And uh, one consequence of having a grant proposal that does very well in the study section is you might be asked to give a talk on how to write a good grant proposal. And that was the case for me. But I'm certainly happy to be here today and to tell you uh, from my own experience um, what might be useful to you in writing an effective renewal grant application. Um, this is the first time I've talked on this topic, and uh, obviously I'm going to give you my own personal perspective. Uh, I've worked in the area of imaging, pet imaging, but also in the, the area of fundamental actions of uh, steroid hormones and the receptors, uh, and those have been my two major funding streams uh, from NIH. I've also had some support from the Department of Energy. So um, <clears throat> what I'd like to cover is uh, an issue of aiming at a moving target, because really the priorities of funding agencies change with time. And, and, and this wasn't really apparent to me initially, um, but I saw it, and I would say at one point I didn't respond appropriately to it with some consequences. Uh, then building, organizing and building a compelling proposal, and then actually constructing it to be maximally effective presentation of your proposal, and then a few other things to consider. So. Um, I think all of you get probably a few times a day advertisements for big manuals and uh, uh, sessions on, on how to do this. I've never looked at this, but you know the 300 page thing um, it costs a lot of money, but if you're the first five buyers, you get something free. Um, mine is, is free, <laughs> and you don't have to buy anything. Um, so let's look at this first issue, aiming at a moving target, how, to focus, how, how the focus of priorities changes. So I think over the course of my career, I've seen NIH be interested in basically good science and then uh, expecting and actually progressively demanding that your proposal be hypothesis driven, much to the um, expense of exploratory grants. And they sort of fought back to get, the, particularly when sort of uh, whole genome information came available in systems biology. Uh, now we're at a, a focus of translational work uh, where consortia often have an advantage. Um, a, a lot of the grants programs are centrally managed, like uh, uh, P30s and U54s. But the Department of Energy used to support technology and basic science in imaging, but not supporting medical use. It was allowable, but not supported. Um, they had a shift in direction rather abruptly. They've come back, but the shift was uh, medical because medical imaging was allowed only at NIH, and so uh, DOE, at least now in, in the national lab, supports just bioenergy and the environment, as they call it, plants and dirt. Uh, the Department of Defense has programs that could support imaging, but they're very disease-specific and they're tightly managed and a patient advocacy driven. So this movement in priorities really reflects a number of things. First of all, the nature of science changes, of course, from phenomenological to molecular to genomic to integrative. There's also political pressure and patient advocacy. And federal support now uh, is, in some cases, uh, also supplemented by foundation support, private donor support, university industrial partnerships. There are, are obviously wealthy institutions that provide a lot of support. Uh, and some people go to places, positions that are essentially endowed in research funds for five years or so. Be aware of the agency's current and possibly future agenda and priorities uh, when you start out. Now, I'll give you my own sort of personal narrative of what I was thinking about and what I brought maybe subconsciously to the table as I was writing uh, proposals. When I started out many years ago, you know, I was a new applicant, I had new ideas, and I sort of said, you know, forget about all the old stuff. I have a new vision, it's not been done before, I have interesting mechanisms, new approaches, new questions, really focused on receptors because they were new things. And I said, you know, I understand the molecular level mechanisms, chemistry, and they're good targets for imaging. And I did very well, and on renewals I was basically saying, you know, I'm really cracking, I've done something that's really new, I'm publishing a great tip, you know, I'm getting famous. And, you know, I've defined myself in a funny way. So I'm a, the chemist's endocrinologist and the endocrinologist's chemist. And you know, in the imaging area, I was a chemist and receptor biochemist bringing unique tools to nuclear medicine. So in a way, I had split the fields 
And I was a chemist, but I was being judged not largely by other chemists, but by what my chemistry would do and who would be impacted by it. And I think this is not a bad strategy because, in fact, I think if I had been judged by chemists, I would have done rather poorly. I was judged by the people who felt my chemistry would help them in their field. Now, then I put in a renewal that basically said, look at all I have going. Aren't you impressed? I got sort of overconfident. I put in too much without a clear focus and goal. And I didn't explain carefully what I've done. And people said, sort of said, you know, you haven't done any clinical translation, which wasn't at all true. So this was actually the first time I missed a renewal. And I learned from it, and two things that have characterized my approach to renewal since then is that I've developed, you know, a sort of a tight business plan with clear goals, sensible priorities, milestones, criteria for translational advancement. And, you know, I sort of say, you know, I may be running uh, with an ever enlarging pack, but you know, I really know what I'm doing and I'm very efficient and effective. And also, I was very explicit that I was committed to clinical translation because I start with a clinical question and then move back to the laboratory uh, to address it. So I think that's really very important and you should choose your funding source carefully and understand their current priorities and ethos. Talk with program officers, current grantees, former review pan panel members, and more on that later. And as your science progresses, evolves, and you know you start on renewals, you can even revise your title to match your science and the funding expectations. And even if you can anticipate things are going to emerge in the future, that's even better. So, for example, one of my grants was initially titled Imaging Estrogen Receptors in Breast Cancer, and the next time it was called Imaging Nuclear Receptors in Breast and Prostate Cancers, because I added uh, androgen receptor because that was when the DOE program stopped supporting a project I had in prostate cancer imaging. And then I added therapy but went back to breast tumor imaging and then imaging again breast and prostate cancers. So you can change the title even of the same uh, grant which that you're renewing. It's not a new grant with a new title but it should have a, a common core theme which was basically targeting nuclear receptors and hormone responsive cancers. Now, the second, so basically, you know, the moving target, you should know your agency and anticipate changes. And within a common core theme, you can shift emphasis to keep things modern, recognize new opportunities and benefit from them. Now, organizing and building a compelling proposal. I'll go over these things and we'll go back to them at the end. So, I think that the review template that I'm sure many of you have used uh, in uh, serving on grant review panels is actually very, very good. And you know, it starts off with a statement of overall impact, and I've sort of extracted the two points, and that is, you know, will the project exert a sustained and powerful influence on the research field? That would be an impact. It doesn't have to be strong in all of the categories, the five categories, to have impact, but it should the reviewer should come away thinking, you know, this would really make a difference. And the first review criterion is significance. And, you know, it defines significance as something that a project that might address an important problem or critical barrier to progress, how will it really advance, improve scientific knowledge, technical uh, or clinical capability? Will it change concepts, methods, technologies? These are all things you should keep in mind as you're conceiving of your, of a, of a grant application, a renewal application. And in fact, I've started to work backwards from the significance. So I try to find a significant unmet medical need or a critical knowledge gap or technical barrier to progress, and then match the research I propose with that, those significant elements, uh, and then establish a core theme that links what you prepare to do to what the significance would be. And there you really develop a strong core of significance, which is this first uh, judgment criterion in, in a grant review. So what I actually do is I take these little paragraphs that you can uh, find from the review document and I actually paste it in the sections of the proposal as I'm writing it right at the top so I can go back and remind myself what does this section really need to have in order for a reviewer to be able to judge it on the basis of what the criteria are for each of these categories. So the next category is investigators. I think you know what that is. You know, it says young investigators have to have a appropriate experience of training, established the investigators should have an ongoing record of accomplishments, advance the field. 
And you know, if it's collaborative or multi-PI, they all should complement one another and be well organized. Innovation is interesting because it says, uh, you know, will the work challenge or shift current research or clinical practice paradigms? Will it utilize novel concepts, approaches, methodologies? Is it novel to one field or novel in a broad sense? Uh, or is it refinement, improvement, or new application of et cetera? So, it, you know, it, it's interesting. And as I was putting together my last two uh, renewals, I, I sort of made it in, in, in the, this section a statement that there's a continuum between innovation and translation. And that translation comes when things are really quite mature and may not be so innovative anymore. In fact, I think sometimes you're, you're, your prior work is held against you because, you, well, you know, that's already known, but it's known because of your prior work. And I think you can make a case that, and, you know, I had three specific aims, and I said, you know, the first one is close to translation. It's not innovative anymore, but it's important. Uh, the last one turned out to be re very innovative because it was new and, and speculative. And I think that's something, that, a, a point that is good in a way to sort of orient uh, the reviewer to how you think about innovation and translation. The approach, of course, they say should be well-reasoned and appropriate. Potential problems should be backed up by alternative strategies. And this, and that's where I failed in this one case where I wasn't renewed. Benchmarks for success, metrics, performance criteria for advancing agents to the next level. Almost like a business plan. If you have at early stages, you need to propose how you're going to establish feasibility and manage risks. The environment, of course, I think uh, is, is pretty much understood, so no, nothing. So again, keep these in mind as you write, and as I say, place the appropriate paragraph at the start of each section. I found that actually to be very helpful. I look back and say, you know, have I really presented what it is that people are going to be thinking about when they write that section uh, in reviewing my proposal? So new or renew is one thing that I think people sometimes wonder about. And I think in general, it's, you're more likely to renew a successful project than to start a new one or to take a f bit of what you're doing and, and put in the new application. Um, as I said, the title can change on the same project, and that should you know, represent what's really happening in the field. Uh, but if you're within the same overall goal or medical impact or theme, you, you can do that. Obviously, the, the renewal should reflect the evolution of the field uh, using new technology and understanding as a basis for what you're proposing. But you can change the title. Um, but keep what's really new at the forefront of the proposal, and it should be something at the forefront and frontier of research at the time. Uh, it's really dangerous to sort of just continue what you're doing. More of the same doesn't go over well. Um, so, but often you haven't really finished everything that you propose to do or new things in the same line have come up that you'd like to do. But a good strategy is to organize your proposal that first presents what's the newest, most evolved, then progresses to finishing other significant things. But there are other ways of arranging it. If you have something that's emerged pretty close to uh, clinical translation, you might put that first, saying that that's the most likely to have impact in the near term. But, but think about that um, and make sure that you really reflect the evolution of the field uh, in a renewal. So some just general bits of advice. Uh, start really early. I really start thinking about things one cycle in advance. And give yourself plenty of time to let ideas ripen. Ferment is another term. Obviously, you get preliminary data finalized, publications uh, out so they're appearing, or at least have been accepted so they can be added as a an appendix, um, and, and get collaboration settled and established. I do that really uh, in advance. You know, it's not the last week I'm desperately calling people asking for letters and uh, CVs and so forth. Um, I really, uh, and everyone is different in this way, but I tend to really want to outline and refine my aims and, and work in segments. And also, I have a, you know, I, I really am only creative in writing if I start in the morning and don't look at my email until noon or something like that, then I can actually uh, do something creative. Um, you may be different. I think it's, even for mature investigators, it's good to show your uh, drafts to collaborators, advisors, and friends. Um, and it's also good, I think, nowadays, if you can collaborate along disciplines, because often this will help you 
uh, have a bigger imprint on the basic t translational coordinate that I mentioned before. Program projects and consortium grants, um, you know, these are, I would say, twice the work for the money, but they provide additional resources uh, that are, don't, don't really come from uh, in individual R01s, and they may overall be easier to get, especially for a junior investigator. Uh, the director of these things obviously has a big burden, uh, but the contributors uh, get a lot of support and help if it's done right. Learn from reviews. Um, you know, if it doesn't make it and you have another chance, obviously you want to respond not by addressing the issues, but going substantially beyond what that was request, requested. You know, you can say uh, reviewers focused on, I mean, you can summarize, in, you know, in, almost in your favor the, the, the comments of the reviewers um, and say this was a point that was raised and this is what was requested and this prompted us to do such and such and as a result we, ha we now propose something that's even you know, bigger than just answering the, the specific questions that were raised. Uh, if there have been true f flaws in the evaluation, I, it's good to speak with your program officer and executive secretary um, because nowadays there's not a sharp cutoff between uh, impact score and funding and I think at some point uh, there are all these PIs sitting, all these program directors sitting around in the room saying, you know, this is really important for our program. It has programmatic advantages. Other ones will say, you know, there really was not an optimal review of this uh, proposal. I think it, it is better than the score it was given. So it's good to, um, if you really have, uh, you know, a substantive uh, complaint to talk to your program officer. Don't expect the world, but it's it's worth exploring that. And I think they, they need to get the feedback if reviews haven't been perfect. And certainly reviews are not perfect. So this is maybe the biggest challenge. Make this a fun exercise. You know, you're going, Ugh, how, how's that going to work? But, you know, I realized that when I was writing a proposal, it, it was sort of a rare time when I actually made it a top priority. And I, I pushed everything out for a while. And it was really the time when I was doing strategic planning of my whole research and, and the direction of my career. And I realized that, you know, that's actually uh, an important thing to do and something that, that the ebb and flow of, of daily uh, stuff that comes at us uh, uh, separates us from. And this is a time when you can do it, and it's obviously important to do. Um, and this is, again, maybe a little tongue-in-cheek. Tongue you know, you're not writing a document. Well, you are writing a documentary in terms of your preliminary results and your past progress, but you are writing a novel in a way. You're writing something you're proposing to do and the outcome you expect and the consequences of that. And you can construct the novel the way you want. It obviously has to be compelling, but realize that you're proposing something and uh, it should be a novel and it should be novel. So um, we've talked about using the NIH review template as a guide to how you prepare your proposal so that actually each section addresses what it is that will be the criteria used for its review. And how I think it's good to work backwards from a worthy goal to form a theme and aims. Consider collaboration, the issue of new versus renew. Start early and make it fun. Now, constructing a ma maximally effective presentation of your proposal. Hopefully, this section has given you a, a, a good idea. Um, I meant to make a slide of a quote that I remember, perhaps slightly imperfectly, from the, the guide to preparing an R01 proposal many, many years ago, and it was about six pages long, not 160 pages. And it, it, there was this phrase after it sort of described how you had to be clear and something, and, and, but it also said, no amount of fancy or sophisticated writing can bring a stale idea to life. And I think that's true. I mean, you really have to have a good idea, a good theme, good aims. But then, if you don't actually put it together in an effective way, you're not going to serve even the greatest ideas um, well. And I think I've certainly had the experience, and I think maybe others of you have also, of being on a review panel and looking at a grant and you say, you know, this is really a pretty good idea, but you know, I could write a better proposal on this idea than the, 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 the PI has, has written. And that's not a very good uh, situation to have a reviewer uh, realize. So 
how you put it together uh, really is, is important. And as I was sort of preparing what I wanted to say, I realized that, you know, in a way there's a heart, there's a skeleton, and there's a vasculature to a well-prepared proposal. And let me tell you what I mean by that. And so again, you know, I work backwards, as I said, and I start by clearly defining an important unmet medical need or serious scientific gap in your field. And so, you know, that will be the overall goal. You say, what's missing? What's needed? Well, it's something that will fill that gap or meet that need. What's the most appropriate approach to take? So that's what can be done. And distill these into a clear, compelling core theme, which I sort of call the heart of the proposal. And then organize the whole proposal around this theme with all parts touching it. That's the skeleton. Now, we'll get to the vasculature a little bit later. But you draft the aims and the approach to squarely address this significant unmet need or scientific gap. And it'll come up later, but I started um, challenging uh, people that would give me their grants, or junior uh, colleagues who I was mentoring, either mostly informally. I'd say, you know, before they'd even give me their proposal to read, I said, I want you to summarize your proposal in three or four sentences. You know, what's important, what do you want to do, and why should I be impressed by it? And the ones that actually could do that usually gave me a document that was really pretty good. But the ones that struggled and, and sort of hemmed and hawed and went on for paragraphs and paragraphs, I realized had really not thought and crystallized and organized things appropriately. So that's sort of a test. So the skeleton you know, builds out from the core theme, which is the heart, and your aims radiate from the core theme. Your approaches and experiments should hang on the theme. But you know, be explicit about this and show how each component works to support the core theme. You could do this by highlighting. You, know, you just have something, either a, a, a background section or a past progress section or a proposed research section. And you could say this you know, uh, would uh, support our interest in improving the predictive value of such and such test in breast cancer or prostate cancer. Don't overdo it, but you can use italics and underline um, to highlight these sections where you sort of pointing out, this is where I am on the skeleton. And, you know, also show how your prior work has led up to you articulating the core theme and how your studies will support the theme and provide needed knowledge. Um, so the skeleton is really a thoughtful internal structure to your proposal, and all the parts should connect to it logically. And you know, as you write a section and finish, you say, you know, where does this fit? Really, what I'm trying to do? Uh, does it? And, and if you can do, if it's that's clear, it really helps the reviewers, and they'll appreciate it. Now, it's easy to get the sort of uh, skeletal anatomy uh, obscured by the great density of details people want to put in their proposal. And that's a mistake. I think you should keep clarity on what the overall organization and structure of the proposal is. And again, so this was something I already told you. I repeatedly summarized to yourself the whole proposal, the goal, the theme, the aims, the approach. Can you really do it in three or four declarative sentences? That really helps you maintain your focus as you're, as you're writing. And then make sure that, that all the parts uh, support the core. The vasculature, what do I mean by that? Well, I like to try to show how different parts of a proposal relate to one another. And this can be background and significance, preliminary results, past progress, aims, and approach all linked together. And then, you know, within each of those sections, how they link together. So, what I try to be very clear about is having every section of the significance, which is also where part of the background is, are connected to the approach. And so the, each significant section or background section ends with, um, you know, this is what's been done, this is what's important, this is what is needed, and this will be studied further in approach uh, aim number what, such and such. And then I, in each aim, I sort of said, as we discussed in the significance, and I give you know, a, a number so that the reviewer can go back and find exactly that section um, and see what I'm talking about. Um, and at multiple points, you know, note how each part relates to the core theme. Each advance contributes to the overall aim and how the different parts are connected together. Um, again, I try to highlight these connections with underlining and italics. Uh, but don't overdo it. And I think bold faces is, is best left for uh, section titles, major section titles. 
So this is something that's a little bit risky to do, but I think uh, is worth thinking about. And that is that you can actually embed some sort of self-evaluation, uh, but it obviously has to be truly factual. So, you know, each of the judgment criteria should be at the top of the section you're writing. And if you think you've actually addressed them in a way that, that is satisfying, you could say, you know, if we accomplish this, it would be the first demonstration of such and such. Uh, you know, or this imaging paradigm, uh, if it reaches such and such uh, uh, performance characteristics, could greatly increase the predictive value. So you're giving an evaluation of what you're writing that's realistic, but it's just the sort of thing that a reviewer can say, oh yeah, that's right, and that sort of helps them put it in their review, which would hopefully be in your favor. I have to be careful about this, but uh, it can be done in ways that actually uh, improve the strength of your proposal. Again, use the review criteria, use the criteria in the review template as a guide and, um, you know, how you might express this um, and hopefully embed it favorably in the reviewer's mind. But obviously, keep it truly factual and don't overdo it. So um, the parts, I think you know the project summary and project narrative, this is important, but actually what's ex extremely important is the first page, the specific aim, which is also the introduction. And you really have to do this with great care. Uh, and I'll show you something on the next slide that speaks to that. Um, organize your significance and backgrounds against the aim. I like to try to actually have a section in significance for each of the aims, um, if it's appropriate. Innovation, you know, we talked about translation versus innovation. The approach, I like to try to keep these organized according to the aims. Uh, and then uh, for each to actually have it define the hypothesis and rationale, I'll be more on that in the in a section. So the internal uh, citations of the vasculature. And I think it's also uh, very helpful to have a wrap up at the end that brings closure. And we'll look at that in just a minute. So the aims obviously set the stage. They're really essential to get off to a strong start. They set the tone. They really should engage the reviewer by articulating an important goal. The reviewer should say, yeah, you know, that's really worthwhile. You understand it and that you have a sensible and effect, an approach that, that will be set, successful, effective. You have a good perspective on it. And then it gets reinforced by the later parts of the proposal. So this is actually from another one of these advertisements, but I thought it was particularly good. You know, use storytelling tactics to engage the reviewer. This is the sort of novel part. And here, most NIH reviewers make up their minds regarding your proposal's merit as they read the first page of your application. That's the uh, specific aims introduction, according to principal investigators who have served on such roles. As they read the rest of your application, looking to support their original I find that's really true when I'm reviewing uh, proposals. Um, and knowing that, you should put uh, great attention to actually how you construct uh, your first page. Uh, if that's really done in a suboptimal way, you have an uphill battle to uh, fight. I've sometimes you know, found that the rest of the uh, proposal doesn't match up to that. But if I start off on a low thing, it takes a lot to convince me that you know, the first page just wasn't prepared in the proper way. So a few practical things. You know, you go through a proposal and it has about 20 acronyms in it and you get halfway through or you come back to it after a while and you can't remember what they are. And you can spend, you know, minutes leafing back to try to find the parenthesis so where, where it was actually used. So I, at the start of this page after the aims, I have a box with abbreviations. And I think that that's something that reviewers will really appreciate and will keep them from getting frustrated and sort of annoyed at you for, uh, you know, making it more difficult for them to follow your, your, uh, your proposal. So in the text, I bold, bold every reference to uh, schemes and figures. So for example, you know, this is a snapshot of a recent proposal. And this is a figure that I think a reviewer might come back to and say, uh, that's interesting. Where did he talk about that figure? And, you know, it's actually referenced on the page before, but it's, you know, it's italics and bold. So you can just scan back and forth and say, oh, there it is, and go back to that. Um, and, and, you know, once he does that once, or she does that once, uh, they'll realize, oh, they can easily match the text to the figure. And these things get separated often quite a bit. And it can be frustrating, again, to a reviewer to have to spend time just 
navigating around your proposal where you could give very clear signposts. So use many titles and subtitles. You shouldn't have a whole page without a subtitle. The subtitles really are a declaration of the skeleton of your proposal. It shows how it's organized and it should be very clear. And you know, a reviewer who's looked at your proposal and then wants to sort of you know, begin to write the review should be able to look back at all the section titles and subtitles and be able to recall the whole content of each section and the whole proposal. You really should provide a good summary of things. And so this is, you know, an example again from one of my recent proposals. Uh, these are the significance and sort of background section. These are the three parts that relate to the three aims. And um, it's all very clearly stated what I'm trying, the point I'm trying to get across. They're not very brief uh, topical things, but they're actually sort of declare declarative things, you know, uh, metabolic stack statics as a novel marker for disease outcome and things like that. So you should really try to summarize the content of each section in these thoughtfully conceived um, titles and subtitles. So each section of significant innovations are, are key to a specific aim. You can see the innovation was organized around the three aims. Um, other as aspects of the layout. So your progress support, which has sort of uh, taken a diminished role in the new guidelines, um, you want to summarize this uh, succinctly. And you know you don't have to list the prior aims exactly as they appeared in your proposal five years ago, but you should sort of cr uh, crystallize the essence of those aims. Um, don't necessarily hide the lack of progress on some, a some aims if you've had more than expected progress on others. I mean, it's a grant, it's not a contract. Um, it's nice to have a logical, revo revolu uh, rational evolution of the focus during the five years. Um, and I tend to divide the progress, past progress, into two parts. Past progress that's no longer relevant to what I'm proposing, I summarize very briefly, and progress that underlies new specific aims. I put them in the, in the uh, approach section. So uh, this was a... a a renewal that had three specific aims, and I state them here, and I mention that, that uh, we've had good progress, and it's directed us towards uh, things we're proposing now. Um, that's actually going to be uh, in each um, approach section. Uh, but then I had, you know, a, a, about half a page where I briefly summarized uh, progress we had made that, that was uh, no longer relevant, but I wanted to state what it was and, and key it to uh, our publications. So um, again, the approach in proposed experiments is, you know, uh, the biggest section typically of your proposal. Uh, again, you know, refer each of these parts to the specific aims and keep the names consistent throughout the proposal. I think it's actually good to have um, each, each part of the approach be a standalone section that contains its own brief background that's a summary perhaps of what was more extensively presented under the significance, restates hypothesis and rationale clearly, and states the relevant preliminary results. And this is best done in really bite-sized pieces that make the task clear with informative titles. And NIH suggests that you have a section entitled Expected Outcomes, Potential Problems, and Alternate Strategies. I was a little singed by people that uh, felt I didn't have a good account of uh, priorities and, and metrics and translation. So I actually added a section that I call Benchmarks for Success and Translation Strategy. So the, the outline of one of my uh, uh, approaches was to have a brief background hypothesis and preliminary results section to describe the two basic uh, experiments or tasks, I call them, that would be done, and then have expected outcomes, potential problems, all alternate alternative strategies, which is their words, but then I had benchmarks for success and translational strategy where I said, you know, if we can achieve this form of selectivity, this uh, intensity of, of imaging, um, so-and-so is interested in, in taking this into a, a, a clinical study, uh, which is beyond the scope of this project, but then I have a letter from that person, so it backs it up. Makes it very, very, very clear things that I think are really important in uh, reviewers' minds. Uh, the wrap-up, so at the very end, you shouldn't end the proposal in some uh, arcane technical detail of the last aim uh, or the last approach. 
uh, but she should provide some sort of gentle summary of the lofty aims of the proposal. It should be the overall impression that the reviewer hopefully will get that you can reinforce at that, that point. And it gives closure to your proposal. So for example, this was one of my proposals. You know, I said these studies which combine novel ligand synthesis with cell-based and in vivo evaluation should lead to the development of structurally novel estrogens having desirable patterns of selectivity that facilitate their translation of the pre we will also gain more detailed understanding. So I sort of emphasize translation and basic uh, understanding. This was a very brief one. You know, we'll develop, evaluate, translate the clinical pet imaging agents for PR, PPR, gamma, and ER, or alpha. So it, it just brings the focus back on the major thing you're trying to accomplish in your proposal. And I think it's very important. You know, both the abbreviations or the acronyms at the start and this, you know, steal a little space from your precious 12 pages. But they add much more uh, than you would get by having a, you know, uh, a list of buffers you're going to use in some assay. So um, you know, in the text, use underlining italics to highlight most important things. You know, whenever you uh, refer back to the overall aim or the core theme or the hypotheses, you can do this. Um, and well back claims of priority, impact, and value, this is the sort of self-evaluation that has to be done carefully. Um, but don't make your whole proposal italics or bold or underlined. It looks ridiculous. Um, so, you know, there's no section called background anymore in the outline suggested for proposals. But I think that, you know, that can be combined in the significant section. But background that's specific to uh, each approach can be there or can be summarized again. Um, and then, you know, where do you put a rationale? I always like to make the rationale really strong in my proposals. Uh, but it's really distributed throughout the proposal uh, in the significance and in the approach. I have a brief section in each approach that says rationale. It sort of outlines you know, why it is we're taking this approach. Uh, past progress I've talked about uh, before. If it's really past, then it should be in a separate section. And very brief, um, they're mostly going to look at the list of publications. And progress that's relevant that underlies continuing or new aims should really be summarized in uh, the start of each approach section. Now, some no-nos. Um, <clears throat> you really don't want to make inaccurate statements regarding precedent. You know, if you say this is the first time I've, this has been looked at and someone does a quick uh, PubMed search and finds a few references back to the uh, late 70s, you know, you've really messed yourself up. Uh, poor or complicated organization, I think, you know, that's, again, really disappointing. And that's where I sort of talk about the, the skeleton, you know, the heart, the skeleton, and the vasculature. Things that are overly crammed, you know, again, if you get something that, that, you know, there's no indentation in paragraphs, no space between paragraphs, figures are uh, small and figure legends are, you know, illegible, <clears throat> um, I think, you know, that, that actually uh, is a downer. And, and make, I try to give a little breathing space between paragraphs and sections and to make sure that, <clears throat> You know, the, the figure legends, uh, you know, if it's from one of your publications, you don't have the whole legend you had in the paper because that'll go on for half a page. But, you know, hone it down so it's just what the reviewer needs to uh, see to, to understand the, the figure. Um, so <clears throat> we've talked about the heart, the skeleton, the vasculature, other things to consider. Um, obviously, make sure your, your grant goes to the your grant application. I remember one of my colleagues went as a one of these rotating program directors at NSF, and he came back and he said, you know, the first thing I learned is you, you shouldn't say I'm writing a grant, you should say I'm writing an application or proposal. If it's really good, it might become a grant. So <clears throat> choose your review group <clears throat> uh, carefully. And you know, you might take a look at who's on the, the, the roster. You might actually look before your renewal is due, and you know, you're really not supposed to talk with people about your proposal uh, who are on the uh, panel, but you know some of them may rotate off before you actually submit your proposal, and those are people are free game game to talk with. And you can always talk to your SRA. You can say, you know, wh what what do the people think is important? And the SRAs are uh, uh, variable in how much how responsive they are, but they might say, you know, there's a big emphasis on translation, or someone will say, you know. Uh, we still value advances in basic science, uh, but it's nice if you could combine that with applications. Um, and your program officer is someone who really uh, ought to be your advocate and your friend, should be eager to have you prepare the best possible, the most competitive 
uh, proposal because in a way, if you do well, you uh, help support uh, the funding stream that comes to his institute and his program. And it's not bad to float ideas. I mean, I did this on some proposal and, you know, the guy said, well, you know, this sounds great, the application you sound great, but make sure you have enough mechanism in there because that's what the study section considers uh, fundamental to everything that comes through. Learn about the institute program and priorities. So there's, you know, uh, we talked about that a bit before. Talk with colleagues, collaborators, former review uh, group members, and learn how things are involving in the current funding scheme. Um, so this is what I talked to you about, aiming at a moving target. The focus and priorities change, and you should be uh, aware of that. Organizing and building a compelling proposal. This is really sort of at the idea, the, the concept phase, and I, I find it actually most effective to work back from a worthy goal. Constructing maximally effective proposal, one that will not be taking a stale idea, but a vital idea, and presenting it in the best possible way, the heart, the skeleton, the vasculature. And then other things to consider, you know, what's going on uh, and how you'll be judged. <laughs>